Disney Marathon, and then that was mine over there, and then Cindy's um, medical degree up there, and then she and I qualified for Duathlon Worlds in um, 2008, and that was that picture down there, and we yeah. we competed and represented Team USA in, in Italy at Duathlon Worlds. That was absolute highlight of my amateur athletic career um, uh, to go over to Italy and get my butt handed to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to do, I did a little research on you and you support some pretty amazing charities and you do some interesting things in your career. And I'm really very grateful for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you. Um, a lot of it is, uh, is Cindy's a tremendous inspiration for me and um, and motivator. A lot of it's have to give her credit. She 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 is your inspiration. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, and I know you went. I, I believe you went through some challenges with with her career and so on as well. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, that looked like it was quite a journey. It it, it has been definitely has been, and um, she's so indomitable and. Um, she definitely believes that there's a silver lining in every dark cloud and, um, and there's something good comes out of everything. And she's, she truly makes, uh, makes a lemonade out of, out of lemons. So, um, there you go. Well, she's an artist now, right? Is that right? She's yes. doing something in the world. Yes. Yeah, she, um, she was always, always an artist and, and just didn't really do a whole lot with it. And then, she started painting, um, I don't know, a few years before she had her injury and, um, and, and had never painted, but just taught herself and was really very, very good. I, I mean, I'd say she's world class. And then after the injury, her art changed. Um, it became, it used to be more abstract and it became more detailed and more realistic. And uh, she attributes it to the the frontal lobe injury and the inability to um, to filter as well. Interesting. Um, so I, yeah. I apologize. Really cool. Do you mind if I ask you? Your your wife had a brain injury, right? Or she? Right. That's what I, I had read something. I don't know that I got the story exactly right because I read it. But she had had a brain injury, was doing something athletic, and then injured herself. Yes, yeah, she was. Uh, she raced bicycles as well as the multi sport, but um, she was really, really good bicycle um, age group, you know, amateur stuff. And um, she set the all time women's uh, time trial record for the state of Florida, stuff like that. And wow. um, she finished 10th in the world at Duathlon Worlds. And she was in a race, it was just a, a small regional race, just basically she was using it for training, and a girl crashed in front of her. And she crashed and um, broke a bunch of bones down her right side. But the worst part was she had a traumatic brain injury. And then they kind of basically committed every form of malpractice you could commit against somebody with a traumatic brain injury. They took her to surgery for a clavicle break, which doesn't need to be repaired, um, put her under anesthesia. And it took twice as long as it should have taken because they didn't have screws small enough for a clavicle and had to leave the operating theater and go get pediatric screws. She aspirated when she was under surgery and under anesthesia and her blood oxygen level dropped to precipitous levels and all that. So they basically turned a concussion into a permanent brain. Um, oh damage. my goodness. Well, that doesn't come up in the article. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, oh go off on that but um so it, it was it was a really a, it was a really tough time and she she developed a seizure disorder um and just went through all that mess with the incredibly toxic um you know the um, neurological stuff and hmm. um finally based on a, a friend's recommendation um we tried cannabis and that was before it was legal. So we, I had to get it, you know, black market. And um, within six months, it completely cured the seizures. Wow. Didn't, didn't just put them in abeyance. It actually cured them. Wow. So we became 
huge advocates and then hugely advocated for the, you know, the medical cannabis in Florida. And then with my last bank, we were the first and only bank in the state to bank the cannabis industry. And when I presented it to my board, it was, there were no objections. Well, there was one objection. It was Pastor Joel Hunter, who is the pastor of a, a 20,000 member mega church. He said, I completely support it completely, completely. I just don't know what my elders would say. Um, so he abstained. And then the next month he said, I, I went to the elders and told them what, what we were doing and they completely approved it. Wow. And, yeah. And that was, that's a, it was an evangelical church. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, when present, and then I had another board member who was a radiation oncologist. And after I gave the story with Cindy, he piped up and said, look, my patients have to, you know, previously had to get it on the street. Um, and it, it absolutely um, is a, is a game changer for them. You know, it, it stops the nausea. It, it makes the quality of life better. Um, so um, huh. you know, what goes around comes around everything's for a reason. And, um, and then we sold the bank. We had to get out of the cannabis industry. And that which which uh, bank did you sell? It was uh, for first first green. And you had to get out. Wow. Yeah. Oof. So yeah. you had one bank before first green too, right? Florida Choice was the name of that one. Um, and there, that one wasn't a you know. There's no pretense to anything values based. I didn't really even know what it what, what it meant, you know, to be values based. And then um, when I sold it, I had a non compete, and my wife and I bought a little mini motorhome, and we circumnavigated the country. And before we left, my brother gave me Avon Chouinard's autobiography. Did I tell you all this already? No. Um, and Yvonne Chouinard, you know, is the guy that started Patagonia Clothing, mm -hmm. and his autobiography is "Let My People Go." And it's a book and it was just very inspirational and I thought oh my god I've got to I got to do more I got to do something I was 50 years old and I thought you know I banking's what I know um surely you can do a bank that has values that that can make a difference and so I just googled green banks and new resource bank in San Francisco popped up and Triodos Bank in the Netherlands popped up. Hmm. And so I just reached out, sent emails and asked to speak to the CEO and talked to the CEO of both banks and said, you know, what's your gig? What's the deal? What makes you different? And that was the genesis of, of First Green Bank. And it was an awesome journey because none of us knew anything. None of us yeah. knew what any of it meant or what we could do to make a difference. Um, uh, it was it was incredible, and then we were asked to join the Global Alliance for Banking on Values in 2012, I think it was, and that was totally transformational um, it, for me and my life and the business. And then they asked me to serve on the board in 2014, and I tell people that was a bucket list dream come true that I didn't even know I had in my bucket. Yeah. Know? Um, and when it's happening, you're going, oh, my God, I just I cannot believe this. How did this, you know, redneck country boy from Eustis, Florida, get on the board of an international banking organization that's that's doing good, you mm. know, that's not not out there doing evil. And um, you know, it was amazing. So but it didn't make the decision to do this one you know, any easier after I sold. And um, you sold and and and. Did they continue to do green work? They dropped the green. Really stupid. Really stupid. Well, I'm, I'm in that industry. I'm in the financial services industry, and I'm the only crazy person that is in the impact investing space. I own two broker dealers, two RIAs. We've got billions of dollars. Nobody else is doing this. I mean, we've got some reps, advisors doing it but no firm owners, nobody's woken up. And the ones who have woken up are the ones who are doing it to make a profit only. They're not looking to make a difference. Right. And that's, that's what happens. Right. Right. What, what do you think? I mean, what's your position of, you know, Larry Fink and Jamie Dimon and their public statements and writings and all that stuff. 
I mean, I feel like they're fundamentally good people, but it's all pretty hollow when you look and at so it. So what's interesting about that is my first documentary film was just called Impact, and I did it as a collaboration with Investment News. And then I became the UN ambassador for entrepreneurship globally to educate entrepreneurs about the UN sustainable development goals through my role at the entrepreneurs organization. So we're up to 15,000 world entrepreneurs that are founders of our businesses. And Larry Fink was invited because I did my debut of, of both my films, Ignite, um, through my film company, Impact U. Film. Um, and I did Impact and Igniting Impact. And both of them were at the UN, both of them debuted. And we invited Larry to all of our events and no response. And he has been documented as saying that impact investing is a fad. People are just going to go through this. And all of a sudden he woke up. So what I'm hopeful is that he's having a change and really embraces the idea. But the reality is there's this transformation that happens between capitalism and impact. And, and when you can say making an impact is more important than making the profit and though we have to make a profit in order to make a business, keep our businesses. And when you can say that making an impact is more important, then you get it right because then it all comes together. Everything comes together. And I don't think he's had that transformation yet. You know, it's like, there's the, there's a, I believe it's an NFL player who, who, um, and, and he's got a funny name, uh, but he had a transformation when his child was born in Atlanta and he couldn't take his child home because the air quality wasn't good. Um, and he was like, but I'm breathing it. And he says, yeah, but their lungs aren't fully developed and the air quality is going to injure your child. And so I wish I had his name top of mind, but I don't. Um, so he created a whole initiative for sustainable um, uh, uh, being at, at, at the you know, the, the tailgating and so on, not throwing around the red cups anymore and doing all the things because he felt that as an organization, they could be so much more impactful. And usually it's something like that that happens in a person's life that creates that. So as you'd mentioned in the cannabis industry, being a bank that would fund cannabis organizations, and I know what I've read and you know much more closely than I do, that you can't do cannabis transactions in a federally um, chartered bank, right? Because it's it's illegal, and so you can as a small bank, but then you get pushed out. And so there's that transformation that happens. And my opinion is that I think people there are people who are genuine, and there are people who are doing it just from a capitalist perspective and and looking to make money. And those are the ones you don't want to align with because they could change their stripes if you know it becomes popular to not fund cannabis or so. Right, right, for sure. Yeah, so that that's they're they're. I, I don't believe their hearts are truly transformed, although they could be getting there, or they're truly on their journey. So I don't want to criticize or condemn. I simply want to say that I don't. You know, it's it's like when women in investing was so unpopular, it was like really big deal. It's still part of it, but where men would you know take this seminar series and bring it to all these widows to to gain business. It's kind of ingenuine, like you're trying to help people, but really wasn't your top priority. It was just a good target audience for you. So right. find people that are doing things in the impact space and socially and environmentally beneficial. Starting to get it. I've, I, I've met many billionaires in my circles that are disturbed. You know, they go to Antarctica, they go to Alaska and they go, we are screwed. Like there is nothing. And then I meet people like uh, Finney and Makepeace, who has kissed the ground, who has given us all hope. And, you know, so, you know, you and I were, were brought together by a collaboration that I'm part of, a guy named Nick Nanton, who's an Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I'm a filmmaker. We're part of an organization called Strategic Coach. And he said, I got to introduce you to Ken. And... Ken, I, I, am I allowed to say that we're going to be doing some business together very soon? Sure. So, so I shared with you that we have a farm and we're, we're planting trees that are drawing down 11 times the carbon of any tree on earth. And we're going to be planting hundreds of acres of these trees. And we're going to be 
the most impactful farm that you'll find in the Georgia area. Nobody even knows about this stuff. And I'm not trying to keep it a secret. I want people to know about it. Right. And, and, and your bank stepped up and said, we want to be aligned with an organization that's doing this. And I believe I'm your first loan. You are in June. Yeah. Yeah. You are. I mean, that's the coolest part about it. Um, and, and I was wanting to really push it out in PR. Um, but then um, last week, the FDIC called me and just blasted me for uh, an article that was written that we were partnering with a fintech firm. And it's like, are you kidding me? I, I, I don't have any signed you know, agreement. There's no partnership. Of course, I would go to you to get permission for a change in business plan. So I'm, I'm half afraid to push your deal out there because they'll say, oh, your first loan's out of the state of Florida. You know, it's two, and, so it's what, two, three weeks from now, we can start doing some, some PR. And what's totally exciting about this, Ken, is I didn't bring to you yet the opportunity, but I have the US's top doctor and, and professor in the, um, in, in the Polonia tree. And he wants to work with me on a collaboration to do a nursery for tissue, tissue culturing for the trees to keep it very pure. Okay. But now they want to do cannabis tissue cultures too to keep the purity of the cannabis there as well. And as long as it's legal, we wouldn't do anything illegal. I'd do that as well. Right. And and it's just the the exponential capabilities because of your bank are tremendous. And that's and that's incredible. So your bank funds impactful companies. Companies, could you share a little bit of the vision of Climate First Bank? Sure. Um, yes, the, and, and probably the best way to describe it is the conundrum I found myself in when I was writing the business plan. And I'm, and it's a pretty formulaic thing. It's a template the FDIC is used for, I did it with my first bank 30 years ago. Um, but I'm describing the business model and I'm describing what we want to do in the impact space, which is totally foreign to them. They could care less. They, in fact, don't want to see that. And I'm thinking, well, we're all our buildings are going to be LEED certified. Um, we're going to be covered with solar, net zero, uh, paperless, you know, big deal. You know, at the end of the day, that's nothing but a flea on the back of an elephant. It doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't it doesn't impact the climate crisis, but I was concurrently reading the book Drawdown and the light bulb went off. Drawdown, yep. Right behind me, Drawdown. Yeah, mine's right in front of me. I've um, met Paul Hawkins, so good stuff. Yep, yep. Um, so have I. And, uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the answer. It's all right here. Um, they spelled it out for me. So all I got to do is go through and figure out which of these things a community bank can actually affect and put together products and services um, and then go out and burn up shoe leather, you know, selling them. So I, I did that and I, it was, it was, I think it was 12 initiatives and a lot of them could be combined into one thing, which would be uh, the built environment, you know, uh, retrofits and all that kind of stuff, um, HVAC. Um, and so we've, we've been steadily working on what that looks like and how do you apply it to um, the economy or, or the community. Um, and I put that in the business plan and, I, and I, my attorney said, oh gosh, don't do that. that that's, that's all new, that's foreign to the regulators. It'll, it'll delay your, your approval. I said, you know what, if it does, that's okay. Mm. Because this is what it's got to be. It's got to be front and center. That's why we named the bank Climate First Bank. And um, honestly, we got approvals in record time. I mean, abs absolutely record time. I don't know if it resonated with them and, and that's why, or it was because it was my third bank. You know, I, I, I don't know. But for whatever reason, we, we got approvals in record time. Um, and, and a, a simple example is our solar loan program that we had at First Green that was a, a good program, but we, it, was, it was all old school. It was a paper application. You just hand it to the branch manager. It takes two weeks to get an approval. 
no way to scale this thing. Um, so uh, with Climate First, it's gonna be totally digitized. You go online, do the application. Two minutes, you got your answer you know, through AI, auto decisioning. Two hours, you get your documents. Um, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, no human has to touch it. Um, and, and that way we can scale it. And there's just all kinds of stuff going on in the, in the solar finance space now too. There's a robust secondary market that, you know, they're getting packaged up and sold in, in, uh, in pools. So um, that's one example where it's dramatically changed from just three years ago when we sold First Green Bank and we can make a bigger difference now. Wow. That's amazing. That's and two minutes AI driven, like that's using technology to its best capabilities. And and traditional banks don't get it. So I'm writing a book. It's called The War and Art of Funding, an insider's guide to raising capital through storytelling. And I believe that storytelling is an art form that all entrepreneurs need to master to share their stories because it's stories that allow the world to understand the mission of what we're fabricating in our heads, our thoughts, our drives and such. And I'm certain you've got a ton of stories. Everything starts as a story. I mean, you probably have gotten, I'll send you my pitch deck. I'll send you my pitch deck. And every time I get on the phone with somebody who sent me their pitch deck, you know what I tell them? And look at it. Because you know what you're writing when you wrote it. I don't know what you mean by half this stuff. And it's all very relevant to you. It's not to me. So I encourage people to do a teaser video or something of real high level of what they're looking to accomplish. And then not go right into the pitch, you know, go into why they're doing it. You know, um, for me, I feel like my life wouldn't be complete if I didn't do this business. I, if I didn't do what I'm doing, if I didn't share with others, if I believe it or not, I'm starting my next documentary film project and it's starting at Cali farms mm. on Saturday, because guess what? We're planting 4,500 trees on Saturday where we're, where we're, we're treating the soil now we're getting it ready to go because i can't lose that window because if you know georgia it gets really hot really fast mm -hmm. and i can't lose that window so i've arranged to be able to be planting trees already and i am so excited i gotta be honest it's just part of it but i'm sure from where you sit what makes a person attractive as a, a, a for as a bank i mean you guys are putting all your capital at risk or your you know, your, your, your depositors capital risk, what kind of stories are people telling you? What sort of thing is it that, you know, makes it very attractive for you to consider working with an entrepreneur? Well, um, that's a, a conundrum on its own, right? Um, you know, because as a bank, we can only do bankable deals, which is, 300 years of standard underwriting and, and accepted underwriting. And that was part of the premise of my uh, business thesis for Climate First Bank is I wanna be able to provide a much bigger capital stack than a community bank usually provides. Um, it, it, it breaks my heart for somebody to come in and need a loan and they, a startup is you know, absolutely impossible, but say they've been in business a couple of years, they don't have a historical run rate. They've been making a profit for six months. We, that's, that's still not bank underwritable. Um, so I wanna do the obvious stuff. I wanna have a full government guaranteed lending suite, USDA, SBA. Um, I wanna have uh, factoring and I'm calling it compassionate factoring because factoring is expensive. And the reason I want to be able to do factoring is to be able to graduate these people into bankable deals and not be stuck in that, you know, vortex of, of high cost capital. Um, I'd like to be able to do a, an SBIC, which is tailored, perfectly tailored for second stage companies. Mm. Um, 
and I want to layer these all in under the bank holding company once we form a holding company, which we will do shortly after we open. Um, and it's it's all permissible under the Bank Holding Company Act. Um, it's just not ever done, or rarely, rarely ever done. Hmm. Um, but but that so back to what um, what motivates us or what intrigues us. It's, I mean, you're right. If somebody tells a good story, that's frequently the tipping point. <laughs> You know, that's what will get a, a loan officer intrigued. That's what gets them fired up when they present the loan committee and, and they've got passion. And um, like Scott did with your deal. Yeah. I mean, what he a- was just so fired up and so, Ooh. you know, excited. And and he had researched polonia trees and he was answering all the questions. And, um, you know, that that it may, that moves the needle. It really does. Yeah, you, you got to be able to tell the story, do it with energy and passion. And I think when I'm when I'm looking at people who are looking to do deals, so there was this uh, the, 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 this uh, speaker, influencer, guru by the name of Wayne Dyer. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he used to say, when you squeeze an orange, what do you get? Obviously, it's orange juice. But when you squeeze you know, Ken LaRoe, what do you get? You know, when, when we're under siege and our businesses are not working or when we're, when we're facing big challenges, have you faced big challenges before? You know, all of those sort of questions, that's the, that's the essence of who the entrepreneur is. And if you, if it's just a funding deal, well, there's lots of options for that not to pay back. You could go bankrupt. You could quit and go to another country. I don't know. I don't know what people who don't pay off their debts look like, but we've right. all heard the horrible stories. But if you're dealing with people in the impact space, especially people who are looking, and this is something, and you'd ask the question about BlackRock and Larry Fink, I mean, what would happen if suddenly, you know, impact investing became unfavorable? I think BlackRock would probably pull out of it. I think you or I would say, okay, I realize that it's not popular with everybody, but we have our segment of the pe- of the world that is interested and we're going to continue to service that. And guess what? Then everybody will eventually wake up and then we'll be doing just fine, you know? And, and, and right. that's what, that's what I look for. I look for the, the energy in them. I'm sure you're doing the same thing. It has to make sense financially, but then it also has to make sense from a mission perspective. And I don't know how many people actually do that when they're evaluating deals. Right. Well, not very many. I can tell you that, hmm. uh, or at least in my experience, not very many. Hey, so so you're, you're building this, this is your third time. So third time's a charm, right? And so you're, if we were sitting here three years from now, the year after the year after the year, as my coach Dan Sullivan says, what would success look like? What would Climate First Bank be doing? What impact will it have had on the world? Are you going to be doing an annual sustainability report or so? Yes. Um, and that that part of the question or that question within a question or statement within a statement is, um, is it was another profound difference from First Green. And we started when we joined the Global Alliance for Banking and Values, they have very strict metrics that you have to meet to be a member. And we found that it was really difficult to granularize our, um, our, customer, um, our customer base. We could not tell who was values line, who wasn't, other than the, the big picture stuff or, of the standard industrial classification of the loan, you know, Um, and we had made the decision to have a negative screen that we weren't going to do dirty energy or uh, extractive industries, all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was easy, but our core processing system would not let us easily drill down. So when we formed um, climate first, that was a primary consideration when we were interviewing and doing the demos of the core processing systems that we had to easily be able to provide the inputs and we had to easily be able to get the outputs. So it should be a lot easier for us to be able to do a, a, a thorough and adequate annual report. 
Um, our intention is definitely, you know, to do that. Um, but three, back to the question of what does it look like three years from now? Um, it, it won't look like what I want it to look like. And the main reason for that is because of the regulatory three-year de novo period where they restrict your growth to the business plan. They don't want you doing anything fancy or whatever. Um, so it's really, it'd be better to say what is the year after the year after the year after the year after the year look like. Go for you know, it. Let's look at that five-year plan. Most people can't think in five years, but I understand your three-year, let's call the three-year one year. Right. That's about what it is. It's the three year, one year. And so the plan is to do a subsequent capital raise, um, which the amount is yet undetermined because we haven't closed the offering out yet, um, which closes May 27th. But do another capital raise. We'll have a war chest of, of capital and then do an acquisition and then take the bank public. And I want to be the acquirer, not the acquired. And, and this bank built to last. Um, I think there's a real strategy in rolling up value-based banks, which will just supercharge the impact um, because the, the small banks, um, all small banks, whether they're values-based or not values-based, are constrained by the same issues. They have capital constraints, they have backroom constraints, um, they have uh, technology constraints. And if we can, um, be bigger, better, badder, bolder, you know, it'll, it'll, it could solve all those problems. And I, I firmly believe that, that to be the case. Um, so the I mean, public it, aspect of it would be from a liquidity perspective. It would be from an investor perspective and so on. Is that, is that right? Cause I know if you're like me, you're kind of allergic to regulators, but you gotta, you gotta get your vaccines and, and, and make sure that you, you play within that realm. You still need to connect with them because of the businesses that we're in. But is that the reason for the public? That and the fact that I just don't know that we can succeed at what we want to succeed at without having a currency. And unless you're publicly traded, the currency is not that compelling. And um, you're right, there's a big regulatory um, malo that you have to deal with, but, but we're used to dealing with that anyway. Now, do I want to add more? It'd be foolish to say, I, you know, I would want to, but um, I, I just, I don't know. You could, you could get to 2 billion or 3 billion or 5 billion through slow methodical growth, but I don't have time and the world doesn't have time. You there you know? go. Um, well, you know, it was Elon Musk who became his billionaire status after he went public with Tesla. So I get it. It's, 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 it's the way you get there. And it's, I know that's not the money that um, is attractive to you, but it gives you stability and the ability to be able to do really bigger things in the future and influence others. So I do get it. I'm just, I, I was just, curious um about you know the the methodologies of going public because i've heard uh, i've had friends who've gone public and so on and quickly reverted back to being private they bought back all their shares and all um so why does traditional banking not work especially for businesses especially for entrepreneurs what is it about traditionally bank traditional banking that just you know makes most of us just run away and say we're never going to do that again well, there is the gigantic constraint, regulatory constraint that you just cannot deviate from the standard bank underwriting um, because the consequences are extremely severe. Um, it, all it takes is one uh, bad, bad regulatory exam rating and uh, any number of cascading negative series of events could occur. Um, there's that, but then the other side of it is there's not much desire to break out of the mold. Um, and uh, when you read the Bank Holding Company Act, it's a tremendous business delivery tool. I mean, a, a bank holding company can accomplish a lot of neat things um, and still operate within the regulatory confines. And, and I think that 
it's just it's a matter of being creative and, and pushing the boundaries. Now there are bankers that do it. Uh, David Riling, who's oh, I know David. Yeah, a dear friend and a hero. I mean, honestly, um, it's great to have heroes that are younger than me. Um, yeah. He he definitely is a a big thinker and and pushes the envelope and super creative. Um, um, Beneficial State Bank, and you know, Cat Taylor and Tom Styers Bank in California is a, an amazing organization that's that's big thinker. Um, Self Help Credit Union is another one. Um, so they're out there. It's just they're not a whole lot of them, and a lot of it is because bankers are generally conservative, generally don't like to get out of the box, um, mm. and then throw on top of that the regulatory overlay or the reverse regulatory plus conservatism i don't know whatever um yeah it's interesting I, I, i've studied the history of banking i don't know how much history of banking you've done but i don't know if 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 you've heard the genesis of the word bank but bank uh, yeah. have you or no i did but i forgot it <laughs> yeah yeah so it used to be illegal for banking, it, it was a sin. It was against the church. Um, it was illegal. It was it was you know usury or users and usurers and um, Dante's Inferno were actually right next to murderers and and prostitutes. And so, a um, I believe it was the de Medici family, who were one of the biggest usurers in Rome, um, had approached the Pope about being able to maybe take one of your beautiful buildings and renovate it and maybe we get rid of this usury thing and an ecclesiastical ecclesiastical order actually made usury legal and what used to happen is the usurers would sit on a banco which is called a bench oh, okay that's right italian yeah and they'd sit on the banco and the person borrowing the money would come up over their shoulder and say i need to, 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 to and tell them and they would make a deal and often they get paid in chickens and cows or so in order to be able to circumvent the challenges with receiving money interest. Um, and in the Muslim religion, it's still illegal right. to earn interest, right? So we hold some Muslim investments and it's tricky, but they've figured out a way. And, and back in the 1400s, it was just illegal to be an entrepreneur, to be a business owner, because it was against the church and against the lords and the king, who was often the priest of the church. So it's got this big history behind it that was really amazing, but then evolved to fund venture capital, uh, venture opportunities, you know, entrepreneurs, and then went really conservative with all the regulatory things that we do. So it's just kind of, kind of, gone a big circle but you know most entrepreneurs are not going to the bank to try to finance and you know the question is where's your business plan and the entrepreneur goes i don't have a business plan and they go make one and they make one and they shoot lots of holes in it and then if you're fortunate enough to get one tenth of what you're looking for then you gotta you know pretty much give blood your firstborn the whole nine yards but your bank is different and you've identified like Sunrise, which is David's, David Ryan's bank, and a couple other CDFIs, I think they are. And I guess from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's probably very smart for them to do their banking research to know who they're going to be doing business with versus just, you know, the behemoths in the industry who are just going to say no at the end of the day anyway. For sure. Absolutely, for sure. And I'm a huge fan of community banking. Um, whether they're values based or not, they just um, by nature almost a community bank has has got some values proposition. Um, but yes, absolutely, and especially if you're a values based entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur, you're definitely going to want to partner with a bank that gets it. Without a doubt, yeah. So so now we're opening the doors on June first. Cali Farms Darico is going to be our deal. We're going to we're 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 going to be fully funded, and I appreciate that. And and we're going to be doing some impactful things. 
and we want to get you some business, however you want, what kind of companies are you looking for? What kind of depositors are you looking for? What sort of investors are you looking for? Um, well, the um, start with the start at the end with investors and the and the offering closes on May 27th. I've got a, a broad mix of investors um, from ESG funds and family offices to somebody that's interested only in the investment return. Um, and so that kind of made me scratch my head about the, the whole uh, Milton Friedman shareholder privacy model. And I got to thinking, oh my gosh, maybe he did have it right for all the wrong reasons. You know, I, I need to take care of the folks that just are looking for return. I need to take care of the folks that are only interested and only invested because of, of making a difference. Um, and there, I, I need to, you know, bring them all together and take care of them all. Um, my preference on the investment side would be long-term patient capital because they're going to understand the, the long play. And that's not what we had across the board. So we have a mix. Um, as far as customers, um, we will take care of businesses and professionals and people in the local community with the exception of the stuff we won't do. Um, you know, we'll bank the, the guy down the road that's building a new auto repair shop, even if he doesn't care about climate change or whatever we'll encourage him to put solar on, we'll, we'll make darn sure he's, he's um, properly disposing of the hazardous wastes and all, um, or we'll bank the young veterinarian who's building herself a new office, and even though she won't do a, a lead building. Um, you know what I mean? But um, the, we're going to very much target NGOs, uh, values aligned businesses. Uh, we've got a, a lot of, of, of businesses and NGOs lined up in St. Pete already. They're, they're you know, they want to vote with their pocketbook. Um, and um, I, I can't name them because it'd be a violation of my fiduciary duty, but there's some really cool folks lined up. And then um, as far as deposits, it's probably the same thing applies and, you know, the same, same group of prospects or customers. Mm, I'm looking forward to the relationship. I'm looking forward to guidance on how to be more impactful. Um, any thoughts on res resources from the bank, maybe? So I, we're, we're a member of the UN Global Compact. Um, we've applied to B Corp previously, if that's beneficial. Um, we're still in a process for that. Obviously, I've got a lead platinum building, but now my new project, I need to get to lead criteria. Are you going to provide any resources or guidance or any sort of um, community for people to be able to speak about their projects? Is there anything you're planning on doing in that space? Yes. Um... A, a couple of things which doesn't directly um, address your question, but I think it, it kind of sort of gets there. Um, at First Green, we had what we called a, a mission specialist program, and all our co-workers could become mission specialists if they met certain criteria. You, had, you have to earn points, and one of the points was becoming a lead green associate or lead AP back when you could become a lead AP. Mm. Um, I'm a lead AP. Mm. Um, and then we would pay for the course for them to, to, to be, you know, to sit for the exam. They pass the exam, they got a thousand dollar raise and you know, that's a thousand dollars every year. Um, so it, it was, we really incentivized it so that they could speak intelligently. I mean, everybody from the tellers, we had tellers that were lead APs oh. um, and they could, they could speak intelligently to people about solar and, and all of that. Uh, so we tried to become a resource within the bank, um, but we also had a, a speaker series where we go rent the conference um, hall at Rollins College, for example, and bring in, I mean, we brought in some national caliber, world caliber speakers, um, open to the community free. Um, and um, with Climate First, we've got a really unique neat situation in that Jared Myers, one of our directors, um, founded a nonprofit called Florida for Good, which um, provides free of charge all of the, the, 
the services to become a B Corp. So nice. they'll sit, they'll sit down with a small business owner. They'll help them fill out the forms. They'll walk them through the process. They'll contact B Labs, um, all free of charge. And he funds this completely out of his pocket. Um, so we we've got a, a you know a great tie with him. And we're a we're a Florida Legal Benefit Corporation. Um, we're the only bank um, in the state to to be a legal benefit corporation. And we are provisional BLAP certified. We were certified at first green. So it's that whole thing you're going through. We, we got to get open before they'll grant it and all that. Mm. Um, we're also a member of 1% for the planet. And we uh, plan to join the GABV when we've got enough size that they can let us in. Um, but other resources to, to answer your question. I know I'm missing something. Um, Dang it. I know there's something else out there that we're planning on doing or we're doing it at first green. Um, and then of course our loan programs will provide um, better terms, better rates. If you'll do a, a sustainable project, um, our solar loan programs are fantastic. They're 20 years fixed rate, you know, no adjustment, hundred percent financing, um, uh, no mortgage on the property. So it's just, it's like one of those things that's, gosh, this is a no brainer. Um, yeah. You know, phenomenal. That's great. And, and, and I think your timing couldn't be any better, especially with the awareness. You know, I saw a great uh, documentary film, which was the year earth uh, changed on Apple TV. It's about 45 minutes and it talks about how we, <laughs> it's kind of like, um, all of us humans uh, got a timeout on a world, right? And so they timed out us, us humans and the world responded really, really well. And it was a lesson for us of the impact that we have on the earth and how it could quickly change. And I believe that the work you're doing is so impactful and it's an example of how we can be, both make money and have impact on the environment, on each other, and encourage one another to do business in a, in a very beneficial way for everybody. Everybody wins. There's no losers in this in a situation that you you are looking for. So I think it's wonderful the work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a, a tribe that's growing, and I feel I the more of us that that talk about this movement and become part of it are, you know, it's, it's in the DNA of the people who were born 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's not in the DNA of people in our age group, which are, you know, in our fifties or so, or even some sixties or seventies. I've even seen eighties where suddenly people actually the eighties really realized the legacy that was left behind. But I just see this transformation of people where, okay, I made a lot of damn money. And I'm not happy yet because I didn't have any impact on anybody except for myself. How can I make a difference? Well, I can give it to places or I can take all of those experiences that I've had in my life, which make me a, 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 an expert in the area and now apply it towards doing good. And that's what I'm seeing more and more of entrepreneurs that are waking up. Right. And it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing to, to, to watch, you know, like what happened with you, you know, le learning about Patagonia. Um, so before we break any, any podcasts you love, any books you love, I mean, I know podcasts are a big thing for entrepreneurs to be able to listen as they're cruising along or so maybe in their electric cars or so. Yeah. Yeah. We listen to a, a whole lot of books on tape and, or, you know, the, the modern day equivalent of books on tape. Um, the, the last book um i read to cindy every night before we go to bed and that's um after her brain injury she couldn't read and oh. um she couldn't sleep either which is a hallmark of brain injury and so i would read to her it would help her calm down and be able to go to sleep so it became a routine and now neither one of us can go to sleep unless i read to her um, <laughs> and and we've read a hundred i don't know maybe more of books but the last one that I that we really loved was uh, John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. 
Hmm. Um, it's a it's a fantastic book about traveling the country with his his poodle Charlie. Um, I also uh, I liked uh, we just recently read Tribe of Mentors by Tim Ferriss. Yeah, that's a great book. Um, yeah, so um, I mean we got a whole huge list of them, but I I don't do podcasts. I I love them, but I just never do it. There you go. Well, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, NPRs. How I built this. Always hear about the struggles. Everybody likes to hear about the struggles. And you know what was interesting is the way we started talking today. Um, you had struggles, you know, that were non-business related challenges, opportunities though to evolve, and you've now taken them to a whole new level. And and you're you're back in the ring again doing something impact, impactful with your bank because somebody didn't follow through with their promise. Right. And I think that's right. great because I'm sure you're getting the old team back together. You're not violating any of your restrictive covenants. You're done with that. And I'm sure people, and this is probably something that entrepreneurs need to know. People are attractive, attracted, attracted, uh, uh, and I don't like to call people employees, our staff who choose to work with us are very attracted to a leader who is looking beyond themselves to benefit. They're looking at something bigger and the bigger your vision, the more likely they are going to come back and work with you. Are you finding that to be your situation? Absolutely. And even if they didn't work for me before, it's just the attraction of of the initiative, the attraction of what we're doing. I mean, we get, oh my gosh, the most quality applicants whenever we have a, an opening. Um, and, and in fact, my, my whole, just about my whole team is coming back. Uh, one of them, my dear friend and fantastic commercial banker started today. So wow. um, yeah. We're, that feels good. Boy, it feels good. And we had our loan committee on Zoom today, and there's Chris, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's like old home week, and, you know. It's like Chris, I'm so good to see you. I want to just give you a kiss. You know, I wish I could, yeah. wish I could kiss you on the screen. You know, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah so, so your attract the law of attraction is really big there because you're being you're you're being your genuine self, and and everybody's on the same page as you. They really are. It really it's amazing so you don't have so, to worry about people's getting stolen away or this or that it's it's yeah i'm on the same page i'm on I'm, I'm 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 working with you to be part of the solution which i think is amazing um what i know so far about climate first bank and you ken laroe as a founder and and entrepreneur has just been super impressive i'm so grateful to know you well likewise steve i mean and that's i mean that sincerely I really, I'm, I'm, it's so, well, it's that whole circle that you talked about, you know, through Nick and um, there, it's all happens for a reason. Exactly. So I'll close with this. I got a beautiful box of five pounds of blueberries <laughs> and you didn't know this, but Heidi, my partner in our CEO, as she calls herself instead of CEO, her favorite fruit is, or berry is blueberries. <laughs> so thank you you're very welcome and that's uh we're helping do good too because that's uh my best friend he's a cornell educated lawyer turned organic blueberry farmer and um the uh the organic movement is under it was under attack by the trump administration and um and uh there's they're struggling and we're doing everything we can to help them. there you go well i think we've got a new world lifting all those challenges we had with COVID and opportunities to transform ourselves in a very big way. And you are leading the charge, my friend. I really appreciate your time today, Ken. Thank you, Steve. All right. I will see you soon, meet you soon, and uh, excited to do so. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Well, bye-bye. Bye-bye.